And now we'll take a tour with our guide, Gareth Mills, who'll tell us all about the Roman origins and later developments. It wasn't until the arrival of the Romans that the hot spring waters here in Bath were first exploited. The Romans were ingenious engineers. Uh, they built a walled reservoir on the site of the spring to contain the waters. They put a vaulted roof over the pool that they thereby created. And this was to become the sacred heart of the city that they established here over the course of the next 350 years that the Romans remained in Britain. The city which they called Aquae Sulis. Uh, translated from the Latin, it means the waters of Sul, a diplomatic gesture, if you like, to the Celtic people whom they just subjugated to name their city after the local deity they worshipped in these parts. And Aquisulis was to become a very important regional trading centre, religious centre, social, recreational and entertainment centre. On one side of the spring was the religious heart of the city, the temple, dedicated to both Sul and Minerva, Minerva the Roman goddess of health, healing and beauty. In front of the temple was a walled precinct through which you would wander on your way to the worship in the temple. So after a visit to the temple, you would visit the other side of the sacred spring, the social centre of Aquisulis, the Roman baths themselves. You might swim in the great bath, lounge around by its poolside, conduct business deals, the ladies might acquire extravagant new hairstyles. Uh, you might take advantage of the suites of sauna rooms that were available at each end of the great bath. There you would sweat it up, uh, the ladies I suppose would perspire, uh, in a hot room known as a caldarium uh, and be scraped clean with a rather primitive instrument known as a strigil uh, before you would complete the cleansing process by hopping into a cold plunge pool known as a frigidarium. So, so life continued here in Aquisulis for 350 years until 410 AD when the Romans evacuated Britain. Thereafter, Aquisulis was effectively wiped from the face of the map. Layer upon layer of silt built up over the Roman remains, the Roman masonry collapsed into this mud. Roman bath lay buried and forgotten about until only some 150 years ago when the excavations were undertaken here. And of course you can see the results of those excavations today, I suggest Bath's premier tourist attraction, the Roman baths themselves with their attendant museum, see the actual spring itself wander through the temple precinct, uh, which was excavated in fact in the 1980s, it lies beneath the pump room. Do visit the pump room as well, uh, where you can taste the bath spa waters yourselves, where you might uh, care to take morning coffee or afternoon tea listening to the pump room trio. So following the Roman evacuation, nothing really much of interest or consequence happened here uh, in the ensuing centuries, the Dark Ages of English history. In the Middle Ages of English history, the period from the 11th century through to the end of the 16th century, economic life here in Bath was dominated by the wool trade. Wool from the Cotswold Hills to the north of here was brought into the city to be woven into cloth. And it was the monks of the Abbey at the time who dominated the wool trade, and it was the monks of the Abbey who were the next to exploit the hot spring waters. They built their own bath, the King's Bath, on the site of the hot spring, unbeknown to them, slap bang on top of the old Roman reservoir that lay buried and forgotten beneath it. It was the monks of the Abbey who began to encourage people to come to Bath, to bathe in the King's Bath, to drink the waters. It was the monks of the Abbey, if you like, who were the first to advertise the curative properties of the Bath Spa waters. But the city itself continued to be a rather seedy, sleazy place right up until the end of the 17th century. Indeed, a friend of King Charles II's referred to Bath in the 17th century as a place where 10,000 pilgrims thither do resort for ease, disease, for lechery and sport. However, towards the end of the 17th century, royalty began to arrive in the city taking the waters, uh, principally Princess, later to become Queen Anne, uh, who came to Bath to take the waters for her gout uh, that she uh, suffered from. And of course where royalty came it wasn't long before the wealthy and the fashionable, the high and the mighty, the great and the good, the elite of the land, the court no less, began to flock here in large numbers. This was the start of Bath's golden age, its uh, century of fame and fortune, its uh, heyday, the 18th century in English history, called the Georgian era, simply because all the kings of the kingdom at the time were all called George, George I, II, III and IV from 1714 through to 1830. 
Now, of course, the houses, lodging houses that existed hitherto were nowhere near adequate enough to cope with the numbers of people flocking to the city at the time, nor indeed were they salubrious enough to cater for the extravagant tastes of these wealthy Georgian gentlemen and ladies. And it was this that was the impetus for the rapid expansion of Bath, 18th century Bath, that we're going to see so much of as we set off now on our tour around the city centre. And we'll hear a lot more about life in 18th century Bath as we go around the city. But for the time being, I'll break off my uh, potted history of the city and start to introduce the first feature we're going to see on the tour. Uh, looking uh, above you to your left, Bath Abbey there. This Abbey Church is the third Abbey Church to be built on the site. The original Bath Abbey Church was an Anglo-Saxon construction from the 9th century AD, unusually built of stone. Most churches at the time would have been built of timber. However, the Anglo-Saxons found plenty of ready-cut stone lying around in the mud, leftovers, if you like, from the Roman city of Aquaesulis. They put it to good use, built themselves a stone church. The second abbey church to be built on the site followed the Norman conquest of 1066, the invasion of William the Conqueror. His doctor, his physician, commissioned the building of a giant Norman church, twice the size of this particular abbey, the third abbey church to be built on the site. This one dates from 1499. It took over 100 years to build. It wasn't completed until 1616. It's one of the last great churches in the country to be built in the perpendicular style. It's said that 60% of the surface area of this church is in fact glass. And it's for that reason it's known in some quarters as the Lantern of the West. Now you may notice how a lot of the stonework across the abbey has been discoloured with the passing of time. It is hoped that when this church celebrates its 500th anniversary, uh, which will be in the year 2000, to have all the stonework fully restored throughout, its, uh, throughout the abbey. If you visit inside the abbey, look out for some fine examples of stained glass windows. Obviously you can appreciate the stained glass the better from the inside rather than the out. It also has a fine, soaring, fan-vaulted ceiling in there as well. Well, leaving aside the Abbey for the moment, the building here on your right is our Town Hall, known as the Guild Hall, designed by Thomas Baldwin and built in 1776. It's the first of many buildings we'll see travelling around the city that recall the architecture of ancient Greece and Rome. And the person initially responsible for this neoclassical revival was a 16th century Italian called Andrea Palladio. This style of architecture is known as Palladian architecture and we'll see some more fine examples of Palladian buildings. The stone wall, the medieval stone wall, uh, surrounded the city in the Middle Ages. There would have been a gate here, the North Gate. The church, you can see ahead of you there, is known as St Michael's Without uh, because it was built uh, just without, just beyond, just outside the medieval stone wall. Now, this particular building, in fact, dates from 1837. There were earlier churches built on the site. And the street we're in here is called Broad Street, obviously not because of its width, as will become apparent, but because this was the weaver's quarter in the medieval city. Here the wool was woven into cloth on broad looms. Bath Postal Museum, here on your left, if you visit it, it's not just a collection of stamps. There you can chart the development of the postal service in this country. It was our post office in the early 19th century, and it was from that building in May 1840 that the world's first postage stamp was issued, the famous Penny Black. The mail coach to London left from this now derelict building here on your left, formerly the York House Hotel. Here, in 1830, a young Princess Victoria stayed on her visit to Bath, and I'll tell you a little bit more about that later on. But for the time being, you'll see how it is now that we leave behind the narrow, winding street plan of the medieval city, and looking to your left and to your right and ahead of you, you can see how we begin to encounter the broader thoroughfares, the elegant lines of neoclassical Georgian 18th century terraces built up these northern slopes of the city to accommodate the influx of wealthy and fashionable people flocking to the city in the 18th century to enjoy their summer season of entertainment. Large parts of this, the upper town of Bath, the design of a very accomplished builder, architect and surveyor called John Wood, and also confusing confusingly for you, I'm afraid, his son, who was also called John Wood. Uh, you'll hear me make mention a lot of both John Wood the Elder and John Wood the Younger as we pass through this part of the city. John Wood the Elder inspired to create for his clients here a new Rome. 
off ahead of us, we'll enter the circus, the King's Circus, designed by both the Woods, built from 1754. It was designed so that as you approach it through each of the three separate entrances, it presents the visitor with what appears to be a perfect circle, although in fact it's built in three separate segments. Travelling around the circus, look out for the decoration employed by the woods on the facade of the building. The three rows of columns in the three orders of classical architecture. Plain Doric columns at street level, scrolled Ionic columns in the centre, and at the top flamboyant, elaborate Corinthian columns. 108 columns in all. No trees originally in the circus. These London plane trees were planted in the early 1800s. It would have just been a gravel courtyard. Here you see these three rows of columns, plain Doric, scrolled Ionic, flamboyant Corinthian, with the acorns around the top I mentioned. The frieze above the doors and windows at street level, they're known as metopes. There are 528 different characters there. They represent the various arts and crafts and sciences. Like the Royal Crescent, there are 30 houses around the circus, the circus, in fact, modelled on the Colosseum in Rome. Now, those of you who have been fortunate enough to visit the Colosseum, it's the Colosseum, in effect, turned inside out, with all the decoration facing inwards rather than out. Beyond the circus is Bath's 18th century architectural hallmark, the Royal Crescent. The first, the finest, the grandest crescent to be built in the country, one of eight crescents that we have here in Bath. The Royal Crescent is the design, like the assembly room, solely of John Wood the Younger, it was built between 1767 and 1775. It consists of 30 individual houses, and the only decoration employed by John Wood Jr. on the facade of the Royal Crescent, the row of 114 giant Ionic columns in this particular instance. Number one Royal Crescent, there is a request stop uh, there if you wish to uh, visit, uh, owned by Bath Preservation Trust, it has been restored, refurnished, redecorated to provide visitors with an accurate interpretation of what these houses would have looked like when they were built, how indeed they were lived in in the 18th century. Here you can see the row of giant Ionic columns, the decoration employed on the Royal Crescent. Many of these 18th century houses built on five storeys. The kitchens would be in the basement, the servants' quarters right up in the roof. Uh, you may notice it's the windows on first floor level are that, that are that much bigger than the windows elsewhere. This was because these afforded the best views. This was where the drawing rooms were situated. This was where the salons and levees and soirees were conducted before you would be borne by sedan chair to the various other pleasures and attractions on offer here in the city. Uh, many of these houses, still individually owned, uh, each have about 18 rooms. Uh, they come on the market occasionally. They would sell for well over £1 million. The centre house here, number 16, a four-star hotel, the Royal Crescent Hotel. The lawn here, still the resident's own private lawn. There's a stone wall in front of it, known as a ha-ha wall. It prevented the animals, formerly grazing on the parkland below, from gaining access to and trampling upon the beautifully manicured greensward that it was and is the resident's own private lawn. The philosophy of the Enlightenment in the 18th century encouraged people to commune with and get close to nature. However, the residents here had no desire to get so close to nature that the animals were trampling around right outside their front uh, doors. So that's why, if you look behind you to your left, you'll see the ha-ha wall. Take your pictures now. <laughs> so, we have to come all the way round again. On your right, ladies and gentlemen, uh, we have several obelisks, we have several pillars in Bath. Uh, this one uh, was erected to commemorate the 18th birthday, the coming of age of Princess Victoria in 1837. Indeed, she became Queen Victoria a few months uh, later. And I made mention of her visit earlier to uh, uh, Bath in 1830 when she stayed at the York House Hotel. Uh, she was pleased to be invited to inspect the newly laid out parkland here and was graciously pleased to command that henceforward it be known as the Royal Victoria Park. Uh, there are many Victoria Parks dotted throughout the country. This is the only one that can call itself the Royal Victoria Park. Uh, her visit to the city, however, had a rather unfortunate ending. 
Now, as she was mounting her carriage to leave, some wag in the crowd was heard to comment upon her fat ankles and her pigeon toes. And, of course, this was a deeply wounding insult to the young 11-year-old princess. She was not amused. She never came back to Bath thereafter. She lived for a further 70-odd years, 63 of them, indeed, as Queen and later Queen Empress. It's said that when the Royal Progress was forced to make a detour through the city on the newly constructed railway, she even went so far as to order her servants to close the curtains of her railway carriage so that she wouldn't be able to look upon Bath and her subjects in the city were denied the pleasure of gazing upon Her Majesty. Well, the next feature we're going to see on the tour, ladies and gentlemen, is Queen Square. Queen Square at the top of this slight hill here, named after the wife of King George II, Queen Caroline of Ansbach. It was designed by John Wood the Elder, built between 1728 and 1736, and was fully intended to be a very prestigious address. The people who purchased the leases to the houses around the square undertook to prohibit all manner of public nuisance. It was to be well cleaned, well lit, the perfect example of a well-ordered and well-regulated residence. The north side of Queen Square, ahead of you on your left, deliberately designed to look like the front of a royal palace, although in fact it contains seven individual houses. Here we can see fine features of Palladian architecture, the triangular pediment atop the centre of the building, supported by, in this case, Corinthian columns, the rusticated or recessed stonework at street level, the main feature of all these Palladian buildings, their perfect symmetry. You could, again, you could fold it in two and it's a perfect fit left on right. John Wood the Elder, indeed, considered the north side of Queen Square to be his finest piece of architectural design. He took up residence in the centre of the south side here so that he could gaze up and admire his chef dœuvre his masterpiece there. We have yet another obelisk, another pillar here in the uh, centre of Queen Square. Well, to date, I've waxed eloquent over the facades of these 18th century Georgian buildings. In a moment, if you look behind you and to your left, you'll see what a mishmash, what a hotchpotch of styles the backs of these buildings are. And that's because in the mad scramble to develop the land here in the 18th century, it was often the case that the designers would stipulate exactly how the fronts of the buildings were to be built, but the people who purchased the individual leases to the houses would subcontract their own builders to build the backs to their own particular specification. The raised pavement you see here to your left, well, of course, this enabled the Georgian gentry and their ladies to promenade up and down, dressed in all their finery, uh, without descending into the streets below, which at the time were nothing more than cart tracks. They had no desire to get ankle deep in mud or whatever else happened to be swilling around in the streets below. Milsom Street here, one of our premier shopping streets, originally built as townhouses in the 1760s, converted to shops towards the end of the 19th and early 20th centuries. Jolly's department store ahead of you here on your right, the oldest such store in the country, established here in Milsom Street in 1831. The modern building you can see at the end of this street, ladies and gentlemen, the Podium, uh, opened in 1990. You can still see how it is that even our modern buildings, however, still hint at the classical style we've seen so much of to date. The triangular pediment, again, atop the centre of the building, still the use of columns and pillars, even on our modern buildings. And from the podium also, you can gauge the true colour of the bath stone, what bath stone looks like when it's freshly quarried, as it were. Bath stone mellows with age, it becomes a golden honey colour with the passing of time. Now, that's when it's not caked, stained black by decades, nay, centuries of pollution and grime and soot. The frieze above the guild hall you can see on your, above you to your right there depicts the various subjects that could have been studied in the technical college that was formerly housed in the guild hall. And again, above you to your right, well, there she is, the Queen Empress herself, Victoria, gazing down in all her imperial splendour, uh, though, Lord forbid, showing no trace there of her fat ankles or her pigeon toes. That would never do. Below you to your left, our river, the River Avon. Avon is a Celtic word meaning river. Uh, so what you're looking at down there effectively is the River River. Uh, there are nine River Avons dotted throughout England and Scotland. This one not to be confused, for example, with that which flows through Stratford upon Avon, uh, birthplace of Shakespeare, etc, uh, etc. Et Beneath where we're standing now would have been situated the town ducking stool. 
ducking a form of punishment uh, used until the middle of the last century, uh, designed to humiliate rather than harm, Robert Adams, Pulteney Bridge over the River Avon. Robert Adams, more usually associated with his interior design, he was commissioned to build Pulteney Bridge there for a wealthy property owner, William Johnston Pulteney, who owned and was developing the Bathwick estate on the right bank of the river and wished to link it to the city centre on the left. Pulteney Bridge was the result, built between 1769 and 1774. It is, apart from the Ponte Vecchio in Florence, the only bridge to be deliberately designed and built with shops along its entire length on both sides. We'll be crossing back over Pulteney Bridge towards the end of our sojourn around the city. The other character associated with 18th century Bath has to be the master of ceremonies here, Richard Bow Nash. He arrived in the city after a rather undistinguished career in the law and the military. He became MC in 1705 after his predecessor had been killed in a duel. And it befell Bow Nash to draw up rules of good conduct and civilised behaviour by which the wealthy and the fashionable flocking to the city at the time might the better be able to enjoy the various amusements that were on offer here while they spent their summer season here. Bath hitherto had been racked by all manner of scandals. There were nude bathing scandals in the King's Bath. Prostitution flourished in the city. Card sharpers operated at the gaming tables. Uh, the sedan chair bearers were like modern day taxi drivers. They didn't seem to know the uh, shortest distance between A and B. They were guilty of extorting money from their clients and charging exorbitant fees for their services. All these abuses, Bonash had to reform. He owed his position of power and influence in the city to the fact that he controlled the orchestras and the musicians that played at the balls that were held here nightly, the highlight of social life here in Bath. He drew up rules for these. They were to begin promptly at 6 o'clock in the evening. They were to end uh, promptly at 11 o'clock at night. Indeed, when a daughter of King George II, Princess Amelia, on a visit to Bath, attending one of these balls, requested that she be allowed to dance on after 11 o'clock, reminding Bonash, of course, whom she was, that she was a princess. He's rather, he rather brusquely turned to her and reminded her in turn uh, that he was king in Bath. In Bath, his laws would be obeyed. Bonash, you will appreciate, was a haughty, rude, arrogant, pompous character who didn't suffer fools gladly. By the end of the 18th century, Bath's population had risen to some 30,000. However, it was at this time that Bath's fortunes began to turn a little sour. At this time, it was apparent that royalty seemed to prefer seawater to bath water, and once the wealthy and the fashionable began to follow the likes of the Prince Regent, later to become King George IV, to newly fashionable coastal towns such as uh, Brighton, Bath in the 19th century, the Victorian era, uh, became a rather staid, quiet, backwater retirement city, stuffed full of pensioned off military men following the ending of the Napoleonic Wars, uh, retired clergymen and civil servants, the retired middle and upper middle classes. And fashions in architecture were changing at the time as well. Uh, John Wood had thought to create for his clients in the 18th century this vision of a new Rome. Wealthy Victorians retiring to Bath in the 19th century thought more uh, of Bath as being a new Florence, if you like. Victorians enjoyed a revival of uh, interest in things medieval. Uh, they had no desire to live in neoclassical terraces, recalling the architecture of ancient Greece and Rome. They preferred to live in neo-Gothic villas, recalling the architecture particularly uh, of the Middle Ages, particularly in Italy in the Middle Ages. We can see immediately in front of us here the kind of houses wealthy Victorians uh, spent their twilight years in. These detached Italianate style villas, often standing in extensive grounds, dotted about by mini temples and grottos. All this inspired by the romantic uh, movement in literature and the arts that was becoming fashionable at the time. Coming right up to date now, if you look through the trees to your right, you may be able to make out the modern buildings of the campus of the University of Bath. Bath University uh, opened in 1965, home now to some 7,000 undergraduates and graduates. It's a centre of excellence, particularly for the study of the sciences and engineering. Indeed, there is no arts faculty in Bath University. I mentioned earlier, ladies and gentlemen, passing through the Royal Crescent, the four-star hotel there, the Royal Crescent Hotel. <clears throat> Coming up ahead of you on your left, this our five-star hotel. 
This, the Bath Spa Hotel, it gets the extra star because it has got a fully integrated indoor heated swimming pool. Uh, converted from a former nurse's home, in fact, in 1989. It has every modern convenience and luxury. I'm not sure what their nightly tariff is, but it's certainly beyond my purse, that's for sure. Coming into view right ahead of you, the estate with the green roofs, our only tower block here in Bath. Uh, built in the 1960s, at a time when it was the developers who had the upper hand here. I'm now pleased to say the boots firmly, firmly on the other foot. Uh, conservationists hard at work preserving Bath's architectural heritage for future generations of resi residents and visitors alike. Parts of Rome and Florence, for example, may care to call themselves World Heritage Sites. The whole of Bath can, so we're rather proud of that. Uh, we're the only complete city in Northern Europe, apart from Venice, uh, to be accorded that particular honour. As we reach the bottom of this hill, if you look over to your right, through the trees at the bottom of the hill, you'll see a terrace of houses. Fourth door in, it's a house with a white door. There, between 1801 and 1804, the novelist Jane Austen lived uh, while she stayed in Bath, just coming up through the trees to your right. While she may not have written uh, Northanger Abbey and Persuasion whilst you were staying in Bath, if you do read those novels, they do provide you with an accurate insight into what life was like here uh, towards the end of Bath's Golden Age, towards the end of the 18th century. A fine example of uh, uh, floral displays for which Bath is so uh, renowned. Great Pulteney Street here, uh, designed by Thomas Baldwin, built from 1788 as part of uh, the grandiose schemes for the development of the Bathwick estate by William Johnston Pulteney. It's Bath's longest street, 1,100 feet long and 100 feet wide. By comparison, ladies and gentlemen, on your right, Sunderland Street there, that the postman's paradise, that the shortest street in Bath. Basically, William Johnston Pulteney was building the Bathwick estate at the wrong time. The money was leaving the city. Where I hinted how our fortunes were turning sour. He had to radically curtail his more ambitious schemes uh, for the estate. Only Great Pulteney Street here was ever completed. Well, we're now crossing onto Robert Adams Bridge, the Pulteney Bridge we saw earlier. If you look down through the windows of the shops to your left, you may be able to make out the water and the weir below. It's the only way that you can tell that we're actually crossing the river. And those of you who have listened to my musings on Bath over the past hour and a, a bit have completed your full figure of eight loop around the city. We head off back to the bus and railway station now before I start all over again on another uh, loop. This I suggest is the most convenient stop for the city centre for the pump rooms, the abbey, the Roman baths, shops and cafes. Uh, I am permitted to say uh, any uh, tips or gratuities humbly accepted. Uh, these are shared between myself and our driver. However, of course, it's our main wish that you have enjoyed your time on the Bath Tour. Indeed, that you enjoy the rest of your uh, visit to Bath, however long that may be. And of course, if you're from overseas, I hope that you enjoy the rest of your visit to Great Britain. But thank you for taking time out on a Sunday morning to listen to me on the Bath Tour. And I hope you have enjoyed yourselves. Thank you very much. And thank you, Gareth. As you can tell, the bus tour is a great way to get a good look at Bath. It only takes a few hours, and it shows you the entire town as well as a brief trip out into the suburbs.